Thank you. And I will, this is the smallest crowd we've had. Um, okay, can everybody see that? I assume you can. Um, so, uh, you know me now, <laughs> or most of you. Um, I'm Deb Schmidley. I'm a Love Living at Home member, and uh, I have an academic background in 16th and 17th century English history. This was supposed to be the last talk in my series, and it was supposed to be kind of a fun closer to the end of summer. But unfortunately, I had to um, rearrange my schedule for the final talk, which was the final uh, Monarchs talk, which we've been doing pretty much all year. Um, and that's on the Georgians. That's going to happen two weeks from today. Uh, so I had to reschedule that. I'm sorry, this was supposed to be the closer is just a little bit of fluff and fun, but we'll do this today instead. And in two weeks, we will do the Georgians. So I picked this um, because I thought it would be fun. And also because it is actually this month on the 26th of August is International Dog Day. And then I discovered later that I think August 10th, which we just missed, uh, was actually national, national Spoil Your Dog Day. And as my husband said, aren't all dogs spoiled? And it's like, yes, I suppose that's, that's true. So um, this was a lot of fun to put together and I hope, I hope, you, hope you enjoy it. Um, I would ask at this point that you mute your microphones um, just in case there's any ambient background noise that can sometimes uh, be distracting. So if you wouldn't mind muting your microphones, that would be great. And I'm going to get rid of that screen there. Oops. And the other thing I wanted to do was, is my video stopped? Uh, yeah, I wanted to stop my video. You don't need to see me waving my hands around while I'm talking. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So to launch this talk, I wanted to start in the Middle Ages. Um, and if you look at art, if you look at illustrated manuscripts, uh, medieval literature of that time, Dogs were always, you always saw dogs portrayed. Uh, they were very prevalent in this literature. Uh, and they were either hunting dogs or they were domestic animals, companion dogs, like lap dogs, as you see here, for aristocratic women, usually. Now, lap dogs were also really popular in religious orders, particularly in the 14th century, 15th century. And in the 14th century, the Archbishop of York complained that bringing little dogs into the choir during services would hinder the devotion of the nuns. And so the image you can see here is from an illuminated manuscript and it's a nun holding one of these uh, little lap dogs in her lap. Dog breeds we would have seen in the Middle Ages uh, included greyhounds, mastiffs, spaniels, terriers, many dogs we're familiar with today. And in addition to hunting dogs, uh, as, as working dogs, if you will, there were also dogs who carried letters. They would have letters tucked into their collars. Uh, dogs who turned water wheels at mills. Dogs who turned roasting spits by the fireplace. They must have been very well trained not to try to grab that meat off the spit. And those who acted as watchdogs as well. But to get to royalty here, uh, the two images here are of King John. Um, King John ruled from 1199. You can see him here with the hunting dogs. He ruled from 1199 to 1216. And there's a couple of images here with his hunting dogs. On the left, he has one. And behind him, that might be a companion dog. It's hard to tell by his by the shape of the dog because he's kind of hidden behind the king there. And on the right is John definitely with his, with his hunting dogs. A couple more medieval images. On the left, this is the medieval author, um, Christine de Pizan. She was a French poet and author. And you can see her little dog just at the bottom of her skirt there over in the, over in the corner here sitting next to her. And on the right, from another illuminated manuscript, this is Sir Lancelot in conversation with a lady, and she's holding a small dog on her lap. So we see these not, not just in England, obviously, but across Europe, you see these depictions. This, one, it, this one's kind of a favorite of mine. I'm not sure who, who um, King Garamante is, to tell you the truth. There was an ancient North African kingdom uh, of, of the Garamantes. And I don't know if he was supposed to be one of their kings. I really st still haven't discovered who this guy is. But the legend goes that he was captured by his enemies 
and 200 of his dogs came and rescued him and carried him to safety. And so I really love this image because you can see the king on the left here and he's being held by these two men and one of the dogs is jumping up on the man. And then on the right, you've got these, these three soldiers in, in armor and chain mail and they're trying to fight off the dogs with their swords. And then this poor guy on the bottom looks like he's getting his face eaten off by King Garamante's dog. So um, King Garamantes was in good company in terms of his dogs taking care of him. But to get back to Eng the English who we're talking about today, British royalty and their dogs, uh, these are the coat of arms of Henry VII. And you can see these at King's College Chapel, Cambridge. I believe there's one outside the building and one inside the building. On the left is the whole coat of arms. And you can see um, on the left-hand side here, there's a dragon. The dragon was the symbol of Edmund Tudor. He was the father of uh, Henry VII. So Henry VII was the first Tudor king. If you came to the earlier talks, you'll probably know that. And then on the right, there's a dog, there's a greyhound. The greyhound is the symbol of Henry VII's mother, Margaret Beaufort, but also of Edmund Tudor, of, of Henry VII's father. So greyhounds were really prevalent and the Tudors were really fond of greyhounds. And then on the right there, the picture on the far right is just a close-up of the greyhound there. Um, Henry VII, his son Henry VIII, and Henry VIII's daughter, Elizabeth I, they all owned several greyhounds. And Elizabeth's successor, the first Stuart King, James I, he was also a huge fan of greyhounds and he had a large, he had a large pack of greyhounds. One of the most famous royal greyhounds was not a hunting dog. All of these were hunting dogs in the Tudor time period. But one of the most famous ones was not a hunting dog. It was a dog called Eos. Eos belonged to Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria. And we're gonna look at Eos a little bit later when we get further along. In addition to dogs that formed these hunting packs um, during the Tudor dynasty, Henry VIII adored his domestic dogs. He had beagles, spaniels, greyhounds, and he owned two dogs that we know of in particular, we've, we've seen these in the records, um, called Cut and Ball. He spent a lot of money on these dogs whenever they were lost because they would wander off and then he'd spend money on rewards uh, trying to get the dogs back. And when he died, when Henry VIII died, they did an inventory of his possessions. This was very normal um, when any monarch died. And the inventory, if you look at the inventory records, include 65 dog leashes. So Henry had a lot of dogs. Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn, the uh, unfortunate Anne Boleyn who lost her head, she had a dog called Pourquoi, French for why. And a few months, she, she got this dog as a gift, a little lap dog as a gift. And unfortunately for Pourquoi, a few months after um, Anne Boleyn received Pourquoi, Pourquoi fell out a window, met a very unfortunate end and fell out a window. And that's also documented in records. And speaking of gifts, giving dogs as gifts, um, this was also not unusual to give dogs as official gifts. One monarch would give a dog to another monarch. So we know that Henry VIII gave dogs to, for instance, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. So that was, that was a standard practice. So what we're gonna do is jump through some time periods here. So we're gonna leave the tutors behind. And we're gonna go into the Stuart period, the next period. And in particular, we're going to look at the reign of Charles II, which started in 1660. So the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, which I'm sure many of you know, also known as the English Toy Spaniel, that has been associated with kings and queens for hundreds of years. Uh, toy Spaniels were popular, very popular actually during the reign of the Tudors. Henry VIII and both of his daughters had several of these dogs and they would serve as feet warmers in the winter. Um, so you put them in bed with you and they'd keep your feet warm, but also as flea magnets. <laughs> so if there are fleas around, the idea was the fleas would bite on the dog and bite the dog instead of you. But I always wonder if those dogs, maybe those dogs weren't outside because I'm like, aren't they bringing fleas in? Anyway, they were considered flea magnets um, to take the fleas away from you. But what we see here, we, we most identify the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel with Charles II. And in fact, that's where they got their name from. So the image here is the three eldest children of Charles I by Van Dyke. And you see on the left in gold, in the gold outfit is the future Charles II with two of his sisters and two little Spaniels at their feet. Charles II loved these dogs. Uh, as I said, they got their name from him. 
he would often bring the dogs to council meetings with him and and contemporary reports sort of bemoaningly said that Charles was more interested in sitting in those meetings playing with his dogs than he was actually um, getting down to the business of governing. He liked walking through St. James's Park, which was quite near uh, the palace. Uh, he would visit his aviary there, he would feed the ducks, he would chat to passers-by, and he would walk his dogs. He liked walking his dogs through there. But like Henry VIII's dogs, occasionally King Charles's dogs would go missing, and sometimes it was believed they had been stolen, or he believed they had been stolen. And this is a quote from 1660, which is the year uh, Charles II came to the throne, and he placed the following advertisement in a paper. Uh, and it was said to have been written by him himself. And he said, we must call upon you again for a black dog between a greyhound and a spaniel, no white about him, only a streak on his breast and his tail a little bobbed. It is his majesty's own dog and doubtless was stolen for the dog was not born nor bred in England and would never forsake his master. Whosoever finds him may acquaint any at Whitehall for the dog was better known at court than those who stole him. Will they never leave robbing his majesty? Must he not keep a dog? So he sounds kind of frustrated here. He must have, he must have had one, more than one dog stolen from him in his time. He really loved having the dogs around him, even in his bedchamber. They slept with him every night. And when he died in 1685, he was surrounded by his faithful spaniels. All right, that brings us to Victoria, Queen Victoria. She also loved um, these King Charles Spaniels. Uh, and you can see here, she uh, had this beloved dog called Dash. She got Dash when she was still a child. So you can see her on the left with Dash as a young, a young girl. And then on the right, this very soulful looking painting by Sir Edwin Landseer, very famous painter uh, during Victoria's uh, reign. And she, she employed him a lot. She commissioned a lot of paintings from him and he did a lot of animal portraiture. So here's Dash looking rather soulful. The future queen treated Dash like a doll. Uh, so she once wrote in her journal, I dressed dear sweet little Dash for the second time after dinner in a scarlet jacket and blue trousers. Not sure what Dash would have made of that, but uh, she, she liked dressing him up. Here's another portrait of Dash. Dash died in December of 1840, three years into the reign of Queen Victoria, and she buried him at Adelaide Cottage on the grounds of Windsor Castle, and she had this monument made for him, and it says, here lies Dash, the favorite spaniel of Queen Victoria, by whose command this memorial was erected. He died on the 20th of December, 1840, in his ninth year. His attachment was without selfishness, his playfulness without malice, his fidelity without deceit. Reader, if you would live beloved and die regretted, profit by the example of Dash. So Dash was clearly um, beloved by the queen. Now I mentioned Greyhounds and I mentioned Eos earlier. We know a lot about Victoria's dogs because Victoria and Albert went to great lengths to document their large, they had a huge collection of dogs and they went to great lengths to document this. So as I mentioned, Edwin Landseer, and this is another painting by Landseer, he went on to paint many of their favorite pets, uh, including Eos here. And then they also had, as we'll see later, a photographer who was photographing a lot of their dogs and, and animals as well. So this is Eos. Um, Eos came to Britain with Prince Albert when he married Queen Victoria in 1840. And before he came, before they were married, uh, Albert wrote to his fiance, you ask after my faithful but not disinterested Eos. She is very well, looks after herself as much as she can, sleeps by the stove, is very friendly if there's plum cake in the room, very much put out when she has to jump over the stick, that must be a trick he taught her to do, keen on hunting, sleepy after it, always proud and contemptuous of other dogs. And she does look quite proud here. Um, this, is, this is a very curious, interesting painting. She's posing by this top hat and gloves, and, and then there's this mallet at the top of the top of the table there. This painting by Lancer was commissioned by the queen as a Christmas present to Prince Albert, and it took pride of place in his dressing room at Buckingham Palace. 
Eos was actually um, portrayed many, many times uh, in, in paintings, including with um, some of Queen Victoria's children. Here is one with uh, the eight-month-old Princess Victoria, another Landseer painting. And I love this one because Eos sort of has her, her muzzle kind of in between the little baby's feet here. And then when Princess Victoria was a little older, obviously she's up toddling around and she's giving Eos a nice little hug there. This was actually a pencil sketch by Queen Victoria herself. So this is a very rough pencil sketch of Princess Victoria hugging Eos. And today, if you go to um, Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, uh, this was a, a favorite home of Victoria and Albert's. There's a life-size bronze statue uh, that stands out in the courtyard of Eos. So another beloved pet of the family. Now, as well as painting portraits of Queen Victoria and, and uh, Prince Albert's favorite dogs, uh, Landseer also incorporated some of the dogs into this painting of his Windsor Castle in modern times. And this is an interesting one because there's a few dogs kind of scattered in this painting. You sort of have to look around for them a little bit. It's kind of a dark, uh, the tone is a little bit dark in the painting. There's also a lot of dead birds. <laughs> so I don't know if this was supposed to depict that the dogs had been hunting, but I do think that's Eos right, uh, right at um, Albert's feet there. You can see Eos. So Lancer was, again, a very favored painter. And as I said, uh, you know, in addition to Lancer, there were other painters that were commissioned to, to paint some of Queen Victoria's pets. But as we saw just a couple of seconds ago with that pencil sketch, Queen Victoria herself was a keen artist. And sometimes pets were the subject of her artwork, her pets were. So we can see here, this is another sketch. Uh, this is more defined. This is Swan, a white greyhound that Victoria owned. So she did a painting in this case of Swan. Now, throughout her reign, Queen Victoria had a number of different breeds. So she had dachshunds, she had Pekingese, Collies, and Pugs, as we see here. A little bit about Pugs. William II, uh, he was originally from Holland. He brought his favorite Pugs to Britain when he became king in 1688. And this was an ancient breed that was believed to have been originated in China. Uh, the East India Company bought these dogs to China in the 1500s, uh, or to Holland, sorry, in the 1500s from China. So they came to Holland that way. They became very popular during the reign of another William, uh, William Prince of Orange, because a pug supposedly saved his life in 1572 by alerting him to an assassination attempt. And after that, pugs became the official dog of the House of Orange. So then mm -hmm. second, when he came over to Britain, he brought pugs with him. And, and they were said to be, again, one of Queen Victoria's favorite breeds. She got her first pug, Venus, in 1853. The one in the photo here is Lass. And I love, again, I love this photo of Lass because Lass is kind of defiantly sticking, sticking out a tongue there. Um, but unfortunately, Lass had a short life. Uh, Lass uh, only lived less than three years, um, born oh. in May of 1870 and died less than three years later. Not sure how poor Lass met her end, but um, I do like this, this photograph. And there's another photo of the much older queen. This is an undated photo, but in, with another one of her pugs um, surrounded by some of her family members. And this is rather amusing one. This is actually Queen Victoria's grandson, George V. And he's holding a pug that's wearing a little bonnet on its head. <laughs> so apparently the young Victoria wasn't the only royal who liked dressing up her dogs. So another breed, the Picadies, uh, as with pugs, these originated in China. And, and at one time, only royalty were allowed to own them. They were considered sacred animals. How did they come to Britain? Well, in 1860, Captain John Hart Dunn presented a Pekingese to the queen after the summer palace near Beijing had been looted during the Second Opium War. And he wrote to the queen at the time, and he wrote and he said, this little dog was found by me in the palace of Yuan Ming Yuan near Peking on the 6th of October, 1860. It is supposed to have belonged to either the empress or one of the ladies of the imperial family. It is a most affectionate, intelligent little creature. It has always been accustomed to being treated as a pet 
and it is with the hope that it might be looked upon as such by Her Majesty and the royal family that I have brought it from China. Now, rather ironically, or maybe perhaps due to a lack of sensitivity, <laughs> the Queen named the little pug or the little um, Pekingese Ludi, L O O T I, after <laughs> the fact that the palace was looted. Now, some accounts say that the royal Pekingese was not given the life of luxury to which she had been accustomed in China. And she would have been very pampered in China. She would have been fed rich, beautiful food. She would have been sleeping on silk cushions, probably had her own rooms. But once she was with Queen Victoria, apparently she was just feeded, uh, fed the normal fare of um, awful uh, kidneys and liver and heart uh, and beef. And instead of living a life of luxury as she had in the Imperial Palace, Ludi was kept in the Royal Kennels, poor little thing. Now we do know there's one photo of her, I don't have it here, but there is one photo of her sleeping on a rather ornate looking chair uh, that was taken of her. But it would appear if you go back and look at everything, all the other records of all the other photographs and paintings of Victoria's dogs, this looked like it was just a one-off photo session because overall, uh, poor L Ludi did not seem to be treated as a, as a favorite pet for some reason. So I mentioned the Royal Kennels where Ludi lived. Um, as well as keeping dogs as personal pets, the Royal family are established breeders up through Elizabeth II. I don't know if Charles III is doing any dog breeding, but from Victoria onward, they were, and probably even before Victoria, they were dog breeders. The Royal Kennels in Victoria's time were built in the early 1840s at Windsor, uh, near Windsor Castle, Windsor Home Park. And they housed up to a hundred dogs. Now, Victoria took real pride in the pedigree of her dogs. She showed six of her Pomeranians in the first Crufts dog show in 1891. And Crufts is like, if you've ever seen the Westminster dog show here in the States, it's like that in Britain. And it's still going on to this day. It's a big, 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 big dog show. So she showed six of her dogs in that very first one. Um, she had breeding programs going on at Windsor, later at Sandringham, another royal residence uh, in, the, in the north of England. And this again, carried on all through her reign, all up through Queen Elizabeth II's reign. Each dog was registered with the Kennel Club. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II, she was actually one of the longest established breeders of Pembroke cor Corgis in the world. Uh, and she also bred and trained Black Labradors and Cocker Spaniels. And what this slide is showing you is the lineage of Victoria, this, I'm sorry, Elizabeth II's corgis. And you can see here, uh, Susan, uh, um, she got Susan as an 18th birthday present. And many of these corgis that she had thereafter are descendants from Susan. And you can see them all kind of listed here. And the ones in orange are actually dorgies, which is a cross between a corgi and a dachshund. So that's why you get those in orange. Now, I mentioned that uh, Victoria also employed um, photographers to take pictures of her dogs. This is Mr. Hill. We don't have a first name for him, but he was the kennel master at the Royal Kennels. Uh, and you can see him here surrounded by dogs um, from the kennels. And they include borzois, pugs, fox terriers, greyhounds, dachshunds. Uh, and as I said, when these kennels were built, they housed between 70 and 100 dogs at any one time. And in 1854, Victoria commissioned William Bainbridge to photograph the dogs in the Windsor Kennels. And this was a project that continued to the end of her life in 1901. So Bainbridge had a job for almost 50 years, continuously uh, recording these dogs. This is why we know so much about Victoria's pets, because again, Victoria and Albert were really great at documenting all of this. The royal family have always been supporters of animal welfare since the time of Victoria. Uh, at a time when tail docking and ear cropping were common, Queen Victoria banned the practice in the royal kennels. She would not let that happen. She gave her patronage to the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. That's why we know it as the Royal Society today. And in 1885, she became the first royal patron of the Battersea Dogs Home. And her son, Prince Leopold, became the first member of the royal family to adopt a, an animal from Battersea. He adopted a little terrier named Skippy. <laughs> And I, this is another picture I absolutely love. So the last royal patron of the RSPCA was Her Late Majesty Elizabeth II. There's nothing on their website yet about a new patron, uh, a new royal patron. 
I'm, I don't know if that's coming or not, but she's still listed as their patron. Uh, but Battersea um, is under royal patronage to this day, uh, again, since the time of Victoria. But in this case, it's Her Majesty Queen Camilla, who is serving as the current patron. And I love this picture because Camilla adopted two dogs several years ago from Battersea named Beth and Bluebell. And this is Beth. Camilla is unveiling a plaque. And this is Beth helping her unveil the plaque. You can see Beth has the, the, the little ribbon in her mouth and she's pulling, she's helping pull the, <laughs> the um, kind of curtain away from the plaque. So I thought that was cute. But getting back to, uh, before we get to, to the current, uh, current time period, um, Victoria's son, Edward VII, he had a fox terrier. The fox terrier's official name was Caesar of Knots. But for those who disliked him, and there were many who disliked poor little Caesar, he was better known as Stinky. He had been given to Edward VII in 1902 uh, to replace an earlier dog, Jack, who unfortunately had choked to death on some food. And Caesar was known far and wide as a dog with questionable manners. He was a wild little guy. <laughs> but the king absolutely adored him. You can see him here with the king and, and Queen Alexandra. Uh, to Edward, Caesar was loyal, steadfast. And the king repaid this, this love by taking Caesar absolutely everywhere he went. So Caesar had his own easy chair on which he slept and it was positioned right next to the queen's bed, uh, king's bed. Caesar even had his own footman. So unlike poor little Ludi during Queen Victoria's time, Caesar really was kind of uh, living, living the high life here with, with Edward VII. He even had a Fabergé uh, not sculpture, but a piece of jewelry, if you will, a little box made of Caesar um, by the famed jewelers Fabergé. And it had ruby eyes and a golden enameled collar. And on the golden enameled collar, it says, I belong to the king. You can just about make it out in this photo. Uh, and this was a replica of the collar worn by Caesar because again, like Henry VIII's dogs, like Charles II's dogs, Caesar had a habit of, of scurrying off, running off from time to time. And Caesar also had several paintings, several portrait paintings of him too. If you go through the royal collection, you can see several paintings of Caesar. Caesar also had a couple of what we would now, I guess, consider royal commemoratives or souvenirs. This is a postcard of Caesar. It was a mass produced um, postcard of Caesar, a photograph of Caesar, mass produced by the Rotary Photo Company. And we know from the text below, it was published sometime between the king's death uh, in, in 1910, and Caesar's own death four years later in 1914. But there he is oh. posing, looking a little, looking a little wistful. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love these. Um, the, the famous German toy company Steiff actually made at least two versions of Caesar, at least two that I could find. They were made out of mohair, um, really cute little dogs. And again, they had a collar around their neck, and on the collar of Caesar's, uh, on the collar is a little medallion. And on one side, it says Steiff Caesar. So the name of the company and the dog's name. And then on the other side, it says E, capital E period, VII, 1910. So what it's telling us again is Edward VII, who died in 1910. So this, this again was uh, produced after Edward VII's death. Now, when Edward died, Caesar followed his master's casket in the funeral procession. This was a huge funeral procession. There were international dignitaries, but the international dignitaries walked behind Caesar. This is how important <laughs> Caesar was. And you can see him here, right there, um, walking along. And the sight of this little white dog and people looked at it and said, oh, the dog looks heartbroken. It looks forlorn. This is, was an image that people really took to their hearts. Uh, Caesar became very popular um, after this image was released. And Caesar can also be seen in stone sitting at the feet of the king's tomb in St. George's Chapel, Windsor. So there's effigies, of course, of, of Edward and Alexandra. But then right at the bottom of Edward's feet is Caesar, and on the right is just a little close-up of Caesar's face here. Caesar went on to live with Queen Alexandra at Marlborough House in London uh, after, after Edward VII died, and he stayed with the Dowager Queen uh, until he died four years later. And that's where he's buried. He's buried here at Marlborough House. She made him a lovely, a lovely monument. It's kind of hard to read it, but basically it's saying, you know, beloved 
companion of the king and then gave me so much comfort after the king died and lived with me till the till the end of his life. This is another image I absolutely love. Uh, Edward VII's <laughs> daughter, Princess Victoria of Wales, she had this amazing poodle named Sammy. And apparently Sammy was exceptionally good at tricks, as we can see here, Sammy <laughs> balancing on two chairs with a little stick in its mouth. Um, Victoria was a very talented amateur photographer and Sammy regularly featured in her, in her photographs. But I just, I love this one because Sammy looks quite, yeah, doing, doing a good job there, Sammy balancing on those two <laughs> chairs. All right, let's move up to Victoria, uh, uh, sorry, Elizabeth II. I've got Victoria in my brain today. There was so much Victoria content. So Elizabeth II was well known for her love of dogs. I think everybody knows this, particularly the corgis. And they really became an internationally recognized symbol of her reign. Her love of the breed came from her parents. George VI bought a dog called Dookie for his daughters in 1933. And you can see here uh, the, the young Elizabeth, her sister Margaret, uh, King George, Queen Elizabeth, surrounded by a variety of dogs here. Uh, in, in her lifetime, or at least over her reign, not even in her lifetime, during her reign alone, Queen Elizabeth II owned over 30 corgis. And most of them were descended from her first one, Susan, which we saw earlier in that little chart that I showed you. During the 1980s, the queen owned 13 corgis at the same time. And they wow. were described by Princess Diana as the moving carpet. So they were just <laughs> roaming around the, the palace, you know, moving en masse together. Here you can see uh, the queen, a color photograph of the queen with Susan. And this photograph you may recall if you came to my uh, talk on the legacy of Elizabeth II after her death. Uh, this, this is the queen feeding her corgis. Now, these pooches were not unsurprising. They were very pampered, right? No, no surprise there. Their diet consisted of steak fillets, rabbit, and organic chicken with rice prepared by the palace chef and served by the queen herself. So this, this uh, photograph is from the 1980s. It was taken at, um, not Sandringham, at uh, Balmoral in Scotland. Her, she would always mm -hmm. go there for the summer. That's where she died. But she would always go for several weeks during the summer. And she could really let her hair down, you know, dress normally, act normally. So I love this photo because she's got the headscarf on her, on her head here. Uh, and she's feeding her, her corgis. There's a really amusing story that I stumbled across when I was researching to write this uh, about her dogs. It was in a documentary commemorating her 95th birthday. And in the program, it was revealed that she wrote a series of handwritten notes to, to a man named Sir Blair Stewart Wilson. He was one of her former senior aides. But these handwritten notes, and, and, and Wilson had them actually framed um, and put on the wall, at least some of them. The notes were not to Sir Blair himself but rather to his dog. So what happened was Sir Blair would write letters from his Jack Russell to the Queen's corgis. And in turn, the Queen would write letters back from the corgis to the Jack Russell. So that's a side of Elizabeth we did not often see. Here's another photograph of the Queen with Susan, with her beloved Susan. But Susan and, and uh, some of the other royal corgis were a little problematic at times. So on June 25th, 1954, sweet looking little Susan here bit at the royal clock winder. There was literally someone employed to just walk around the palaces winding royal clocks all the time. And this poor guy got bit by Susan. And then five days after she bit him, she attacked a grenadier guard and palace sentry. And one of the queen mother's corgis, one of Elizabeth II's mother's corgis, bit a policeman. So corgis are known, if you've been around corgis, they're very nippy little dogs. Uh, in 1989, Ranger, another one of the queen mother's dogs, actually, this was really bad, led a group of corgis that killed one of the queen's dogs. So they, they were kind of vicious in a pack. In 1991, Elizabeth II received three stitches in her hand after breaking up a scuffle between her pack of 10 corgis and those of the Queen Mother's. So she ended up needing stitches. And at the same time, a chauffeur tried to intervene when this fight was going on, and he too was bitten, and he had to go get a tetanus shot. So mm -hmm. beloved pets, but you know, a little dangerous to be around sometimes, a little nippy. 
uh, like we saw with Dash and like we saw with Caesar, uh, when Susan died, she was given a burial in her own little tombstone. And uh, it said the queen was heartbroken when she died, uh, when, when Susan died in 1959. And she is buried in a pet cemetery on the Sandringham estate. And here is a picture later in life. Um, Victoria, uh, why do I keep calling her Victoria II? Elizabeth II, um, on the cover of Vanity Fair, shot by the famous photographer Annie Leibowitz with her four dogs at this time. And I want to show you a video. I will warn you ahead of time, if you don't like barking dogs, uh, you might want to mute your sound. I, I, this is um, Elizabeth with the dogs. I'm going to jump over part of it. I'm not going to show you the entire thing. We're going to skip a little bit of the middle part of it. But this just kind of gives you this idea of the moving carpet, <laughs> if you will. And, and at one point, the queen is trying to remember the names of all of her corgis. And at another point, if you listen carefully, it's kind of hard to hear. But later in the video, she makes the comment, I don't have many dogs now. And I was thinking, you look like you have a lot of dogs to me. But <laughs> I guess not, not compared to what she had. up to where she's naming the dogs. No, oh, that's Emma. That's my mother, daughter, Linnet. Linnet's daughters, brother, Linnet's other children. And there's a two different daughters. These ones. Together. And that's Emma, Linnet, Linnet and Monty, Hello and Holly, and Balkan and Hannah, the smallest. Any dogs left? They're gone. <laughs> Don't eat it. Come on. Come on. No. Okay, so there is there is Elizabeth with her dogs. Um, now, when the Queen died, uh, this this is actually a touching photo, a little bit like Edward the uh, funeral procession and Caesar. When she died, she had two corgis, Mick and Sandy, and you can see them here. They were brought out by a, a couple of the staff from Windsor Castle to watch her funeral procession as it went by uh, in Windsor as she was being taken to her burial site. 
Luckily for Mick and Sandy, they were adopted by the Queen's second son, Prince Andrew, and his ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson, who still lives with Prince Andrew. And Sarah Ferguson, uh, the Duchess of, of York, frequently posts um, videos or little pictures on Instagram showing the corgis and showing how happy they are now um, having been rehoused, as much as I'm sure they, they missed their mistress. That brings us to the present uh, monarch, King Charles. Like his mother before him, he was a dog lover. Uh, and here are some early photographs that you could see of him with various dogs from the time he was still in his pram up until he was a young man. Now, Charles hasn't carried on the tradition of royal corgis. When he was Prince of Wales, he had a much beloved retriever named Harvey, you see here on the left. And again, I like this photo because he's kissing Harvey on the nose. And he had at least two Jack Russell Terriers, Pooh and Tigga. And I believe this might be Tigga on, on the right here with him. Poor Harvey had to be rehoused after Prince Charles married Diana Spencer because apparently Princess Diana objected to Harvey. She thought he smelled. She didn't, she didn't like the smell of Harvey. So Harvey went to live with one of Prince Charles's friends. But as for the Jack Russells, uh, Pooh and Tigga, unfortunately Pooh in 1994 disappeared and was never found. But Tigga had quite a long life with the prince. Here's a picture of Tigga being fed by Prince, then Prince Charles during a polo match. And so Tigga came to Prince Charles as a puppy uh, and then died in 2002 at the age of 18. So had a nice ripe long life and was later memorialized in this wicker sculpture that's in the garden of Charles's country estate, Highgrove House. Today, uh, Charles's current wife, um, Queen Camilla, as we saw before, she obviously loves dogs. She, she um, adopted two from Battersea. And you can see them here. The picture on the left-hand corner was the official portrait that Charles and Camilla um, released for their 15th wedding anniversary. And you see them here with Beth and Bluebell. And then you can see Beth and Bluebell on the right with their little blue kerchiefs around their necks and the two photos above, one um, with one of the two dogs hiking with the queen and one with the king on the other side. Camilla so loves her dogs that her coronation robe which was filled with all kinds of symbolism in the embroidery in her coronation robe, including the names of her children and grandchildren. So the, you can see here, if I can get my cursor here, Gus, that's one of her grandsons. But she also had embroidered in the hem of the robe, Beth and Bluebell. So there's one of them. All right, now this talk was called Royal Hounds, but we are gonna deviate a little bit because I wanted to talk about some other royal critters as well. And there were other royal critters besides hounds. Going all the way back to the Middle Ages again, when we think of the Tower of London, we often think of a prison, right? Or we think of executions. But the Tower of London didn't always hold prisoners. So around 1200, King John, the one we saw way back in the beginning of the talk with his hunting dogs, he bought three crate loads of exotic animals back to England from Normandy. And he housed them at the Tower of London. And from that point on, a royal menagerie was created. And over the, the years and decades, every monarch would be gifted with more and more of these exotic animals. So it grew over time. The collection included, it was amazing, uh, African lions, elephants, rhinos, kangaroos, ostriches, chimpanzees, beavers, flying squirrels, cranes, storks, alligators and bears, including a polar bear that was given to Henry III by the King of Norway. And the polar bear, of course, normally would have been chained up, but it was allowed to swim in the Thames. So that must have been quite a sight for Londoners to see this polar bear swimming in the Thames River. By the time of Elizabeth I in the mid 1500s, uh, the menagerie had become a very popular tourist site. So you could pay to go in and visit this zoo, if you would, this menagerie, if you would, or more gruesomely, uh, if you didn't have the money or you didn't wanna pay cash to visit, you could offer a cat or dog to be fed to the carnivores. Uh, this was actually the beginning of the Tower of London becoming a tourist attraction. But at that time, it was for the Royal Menagerie. Now these animals do not look very happy here and with good reason. 
in the 17th century, 18th century, really, um, and 19th century, the animals were not treated well. The, the caretakers for them were not trained on how to take care of animals, particularly exotic animals. They were suffering from diseases. They were not fed well. Some of them were dying. So in 1826, the constable of the tower, who was the Duke of Wellington at that time, he decided to send 150 of these animals. This is how crowded this, I mean, tons of animals in here, 150 to Regent's Park. He wanted to rehouse them in Regent's Park. That was the inception of the London Zoo and the London Zoo is still in Regent's Park today. The menagerie itself was shut down totally in 1835. Many of the existing animals were sold to zoos or to traveling circuses, whatever was left. But you can see tourists here gawking at these poor animals in the cages. Now this one's fun and I love this one. If you go over to St. James's Park, very near Buckingham Palace, you can see the resident pelicans. There have been pelicans in the park for nearly 400 years. How did we get pelicans? Well, they were originally presented as a gift from the Russian ambassador to Charles II in 1664, the same Charles II who would walk through St. James's Park, visiting his aviary and walking his dogs and losing his dogs. Uh, and since then, over 40 pelicans have made St. James Park their home. Today, there are six pelicans, uh, five Eastern whites and one South American white, and their names are Sun, Moon, Star, Isla, Tiffany, and Gargi. All but one that live there today came from the Prague Zoo. They're extremely social. They're, they're quite used to human companionship. So it's really not unusual for them to kind of leave the lake. There's a little lake in St. James's Park and there's a little kind of rocky island that they like to hang out on. But it's not unusual for them to come off the lake and sit on benches right alongside office workers and tourists. So you can see here, one's having quite a conversation <laughs> with this woman. Uh, but the park rangers are you know, really trying to discourage this. They really don't want the, the pelicans to have uh, contact with humans. And again, this was a, another favorite shot of mine. So during the, the uh, beginning of the pandemic in 2020, uh, England and Europe, un unlike the United States, I mean, we shut down, but we didn't really shut down. We, everything closed, but you could still go out. You could still do whatever you wanted, basically, if you could find any place open. Uh, but in Europe and in England, they were very, very strict. You could not go out unless it was to go to the doctor. You could go out to go get groceries but you could not be out just wandering around, sitting in the park, doing whatever. You could get actually fined, uh, get, get a heavy fine and a ticket for that. So the streets in London were totally deserted and the Pelicans decided to take advantage of this. The, the St. James Park Pelicans said, oh, let's go wander. So they were, this is a picture of them on the aptly named Birdcage Walk. This is where the Royal Aviary used to be. Um, just wandering, wandering down the road, having a, having a gay old time out on the town. Now, while it is discouraged for humans to get too close to the pelicans, you know, the, the uh, groundskeepers do not want, the park wardens do not want the pelicans to get too used to humans. Uh, you can see the pelicans every day at 2.30. If you go over, you can see them close up being fed. Every afternoon at 2.30, they're fed and you can go over and watch them. Obviously, this picture is an old one. This is from 1936. But uh, one of the park wardens comes over and feeds them and usually talks a little bit about their history and their behavior and things. So if you want to see them close up, a lot of the times they're just hanging out on that rock in the middle of the lake. But if you want to see them close up, go over at 2.30 every afternoon and you can see them being fed. Now, the royal family, as we know, well known for their love of dogs, but there were a few cats, very few cats, but a few cats that became royal pets. This is Snowdrop. Snowdrop was a favorite pet of Queen Victoria's son, Prince Leopold, the same one who adopted a pet from the Battersea Dog Home. And Snowball, you can see here, was photographed by William Bainbridge, again, that photographer that documented all of Victoria's dogs in the kennels. Uh, so this is a, a portrait of... Um, Snowdrop from July of 1856. But getting back to non-mammals, if you will, um, Victoria also had a number of parrots and, and, and including her dog, she had parrots. She had a blue and green Brazilian parent called Pedro. Uh, and she also had several highly trained gray parrots who would entertain her apparently by speaking French and they would make jokes 
and they even toasted her good health. So they were very well trained to amuse the, the queen. This is another Edwin Landseer painting, and this shows us Hector, who was a Spanish deer hound on the right, and then Nero, a black greyhound on the left. Dash, who we've talked about before, sitting at their feet, lying at their feet on this little cushion. And then the parrot Lori, right, right below, uh, be, below Dash. Uh, and Perry, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Lori is sitting there on a little tray uh, eating cracked nuts. So even the parrots got their portraits painted. And speaking of birds, uh, the late Elizabeth II had pet budgies. She had a collection of more than 100 birds at Windsor Castle. This goes back in the, to the 1930s when she was given two Liberty budgies as a gift. So on the left, again, in this picture, you can see the young Elizabeth and Princess Margaret and the then Queen Elizabeth with, of course, a corgi in the foreground there, but they're there at the aviary. And then on the right, uh, a more grown up Elizabeth and her sister with, with their father. So she got these, these Liberty budgies, they're free flying birds. They're bright green and blue and yellow. I couldn't find a good photograph to share with you a color photograph. They're smaller than caged domestic birds. So because they were free flying, the, the keeper of the Royal budgies, uh, Graham Stone, he said they were able to fly free from their aviary. There's a mesh tube that would go from the aviary to an outside perch that they could sit on. And someone asked him and said, well, aren't you afraid they're gonna take off and disappear? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. They always come back because they know where the food is. So they, they know where to get fed. So they always come back. And he said the queen really loved the budgies just like she loved her dogs. And one time she actually saved the life of one when its leg got caught up in wire caging and it was stuck. Now, here's an animal you probably would not associate with Elizabeth II. Uh, as a child, she received a chameleon and it was given to her by her cousin, Louis Mountbatten. And according to her royal nanny, who wrote a rather controversial memoir about um, Elizabeth and Margaret, uh, the nanny's name was um, Marion Crawford. She wrote, Princess Elizabeth was thrilled and quickly had a box made to keep the creature. We know that when the chameleon eventually died, the princess insisted on giving her pet a funeral, um, Crawford tells us. So a groundskeeper made a small white coffin and the princess, her sister Margaret, and their nanny, uh, Marion Crawford, held a solemn graveside service. And Elizabeth said prayers over, over the grave of her pet. So we're gonna finish up with non-dogs um, with something a little bit different. You may, have, you may have heard a little bit about the royal swans. Each July, David Barber, who is the British monarch's official royal swan marker, this is a position he's held for over three decades. He leads a five-day expedition on these rowing skiffs, these traditional rowing skiffs. They go out onto the Thames and they collect data and they assess the health of swans on the Thames. Barber is dressed in a red jacket. He has a cap that has a large swan feather coming out of it. You'll see him later. Uh, and he and his company, uh, the people that accompany him, are joined by professor of zoology at Oxford University, Christopher Perrins. Christopher Perrins' role is as the Royal Swan Warden. And he oversees the swan survey. And then in addition to them, there are also representatives from the swan sanctuary. And they're on hand to take care of any wounded or unhealthy birds. So you've got these teams that go out in these boats. Uh, they're also joined by, and I'll talk about them a little more later, but they're also joined by members of the Worshipful Company of Vintners and members of the Worshipful Company of Dyers. So the boats go out, the king's boats, the monarch's boats, they fly the monarch's standard. Uh, the company boats, the Worshipful Companies, they have their own flags. They're all dressed in different uniforms accordingly to who they are. And we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. But basically what happens is the boats circle a family of swans. They lift them out of the water. They weigh them. They check for any injuries. And they put tracking rings on them. And this annual expedition, it's 79 miles long along the River Thames, is known as Swan Upping. And it traces its origins way, way back to a centuries-old English law that basically gives the reigning monarch the right to claim any unmarked mute swans. And these are mute swans. I took this picture 
near between Windsor Castle and Eaton, there's a bridge that goes over the river uh, between the town of Windsor and Eaton, uh, and there are tons and tons of swans there. Uh, so any unmarked mute swans in open water belong to the monarch. The monarch can claim them. But nowadays, of course, this is more by way, as I said, sort of a census uh, and a wildlife conservation effort on behalf, of, on behalf of the birds. In medieval times, owning swans was seen as the height of luxury. It was an honor reserved only for royals or the immensely wealthy and powerful. And those people, the immensely wealthy and powerful, actually had to be given permission by, by the monarchs. Swans were once seen as a rare delicacy. Henry III ordered 40 swans for his Christmas banquet in 1247. Uh, eating swans was quite popular at this time, but it eventually fell out of favor in the 18th century. But it wasn't made illegal until 1981. Up until 1981, it was not illegal to eat swans, to, to hunt and eat swans. But after 1981, they were protected as, uh, as wild birds. It's unclear exactly when the monarchy began owning the nation's swans. Some sources date it back to the 12th century. David Barber, who I mentioned earlier, he said he found a reference to a king in 966 that was granting permission to a group of monks to own some stray swans. So the belief was even then the monarchy actually owned the swans. What we do know for sure is that in the 1500s, Elizabeth I, she wanted to round up some of these swans that were in the open water. But there was an objection, uh, an official objection against this because some people came forward and said, no, 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 we own these swans. The queen can't take these swans. There was a court case and the court ruled in favor of the queen and said the queen has the right to any unmarked swans. So again, if, the, if you hadn't put a mark on your swan somehow, then the monarch had the right to them. And that is a law that still stands to this day. So Charles III can literally can, you know, claim, legally claim any unmarked mute swans in open water. But as I said before, he does share these with these two livery companies that I that I mentioned. So um, and the livery companies go back to the medieval times of old ancient trade guilds, London trade guilds. So the worshipful company of vintners and the worshipful company of dyers, but their, their swans are marked. They have to be marked and they are marked. And since Tudor times, those two companies have, have um, supervised the well-being of the swans on the Thames along with the monarch. So this goes back a long, long way. Here is David Barber uh, in his red jacket feeding some of the swans. And you can just see his feather up here, the swan feather up here. This job, this swan upping is not for the faint, uh, faint of heart. <laughs> swans can be uh, somewhat nasty little creatures, not little creatures, nasty big creatures. So you can see this man here, he's, he's almost falling out of the boat trying to get a hold of the swan. And they're big. So once, once they're in the boat, you know, they're not all that happy to, to be handled. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a powerful job. The signets are a little more placid once they're once they're you know caught their their feet are tied and here they are being weighed the signets are being weighed now this year because of an outbreak of avian flu as well as encounters with animals and unfortunately aggressive humans the number of swans are down the counters on the river thames recorded 94 signets uh, that's what the young swans are called compared to 155 last year. So that's a big drop. It's about a 40% drop and it's very um, worrisome um, for, for nature um, conservators and, and for animal lovers as well. The queen is, it was very interested in this process of swan upping. Supposedly one time she went out in one of the skiffs. This is a later photo of her um, examining one of the signets. I want to show you a couple of little videos about swan upping. Just now, the first one um, gives you a little bit of the background I already gave you, but there's some interesting bits in it. And then I'm going to show you a second one with an interview with David Barber, um, and, and you can see some more of the swan upping. The annual event of swan upping takes place in the third week of July. It began around 900 years ago and originally was a way of allocating the ownership of the swans. Swans were a prized bird, eaten at many feasts, and ownership was a sign of importance and status. Now, swan upping is about counting and checking the swans, 
to make sure they are healthy and educating people about the importance of swan upping and swan conservation. The swan uppers spend time during swan upping week talking to school groups about how to protect swans and conserve the river environment for the safety of all wildlife. The work of rescue organisations such as Swan Lifeline has increased public awareness of swan welfare and swan upping. Today the Queen may exercise her royal prerogative to claim ownership of any unmarked mute swan swimming in open waters in the UK, but this right is mainly exercised on the River Thames. There are three other bodies that can own swans. The Ilchester family has swans at Abbotsbury in Dorset, and the Vintners and Dyers Livery Companies own swans on the River Thames by grant of a royal charter. A livery company is a trading organisation. The Vintners traditionally traded in wine, and the Dyers were cloth dyers. Today, both companies do considerable charitable and educational work. Swan upping is a colourful sight, as the swan uppers still dress in their traditional uniforms. The Royal Swan Uppers wear a scarlet coloured blazer, the Vintners wear white and black, and the Dyers wear navy blue. Traditionally, the Swan Markers wear a swan feather in their caps. Each boat has its own special flag and the blades of the oars match the colour of each Swan Upping uniform. The Swan Uppers use traditional Thames skiffs during Swan Upping week. The skiffs are clinker built, which means each edge of the wooden planks overlaps another. This design gives strength and shape to the hull and makes the construction watertight. The same design was used by the Vikings. The main body or hull of the skiff is mahogany and varnished to reduce water resistance and to preserve the wood. The oar sits between two oak fowl pins which are removable. The pins reduce damage to the main structure of the boat as they are worn away by the oars and can easily be replaced. The swan uppers use traditional wooden spoon oars and the skiffs are steered by pulling ropes attached to the rudder. The Crown, the Worshipful Company of Vintners and the Worshipful Company of Dyers have maintained the tradition of swan upping on the River Thames. During swan upping, the ownership of the young signets is divided between the Queen and the two livery companies. The swan upping journey takes five days and the swan uppers travel a total of 79 miles, starting in Sunbury and rowing upstream to Abingdon. The event is popular and attracts many spectators. By the end of the first day, the Swan Uppers reach Romney Lock near Windsor Castle, where they join together in a toast to Her Majesty the Queen, Signor of the Swans. The Queen! The Queen! The Queen. The Queen. During the journey, when one of the Swan Uppers spots a brood or family of swans, they shout. This message is passed down to all the boats and gradually, as a team, they create a circle around the swans in their wooden boats called skiffs. Then we, we gradually put, the, put one boat in, the next boat follows behind inside of it, and then we get the swans in like a pen with the, with the shore of that side and then the boats the other side. Then we shorten all the boats up and make the pen smaller and smaller. And then we take the families, we can pick them out of all today. Boats in, making the circle smaller. Then the family of swans can be lifted safely from the water into the boats. Okay, let me take you to the second one. Um, and we'll watch a bit of this one. Oops. Do that again. There we go. <laughs> So, we will start off from Sunbury and we will go for five days upstream to um, Abingdon. 
how we actually catch the swans is we circle the the boat around the swans a brood of swans this is a new family of swans and we would work the boats in closer and closer together and then we will lift the swans from the water take them ashore we have Professor Perrins here from the Oxford University of Zoology. Um, we will check them for fishing tackle problems, um, any leaded problems, weigh it. them, measure them, put the ring on them. They will all be recorded and then they're placed back in the river. Okay. Because we don't have much time and we don't know how old the birds were because we're not monitoring the hatching. Um, we measure the heads and that gives you a very rough, it's not very precise age. And then we, we weigh them and using a, a weight for age, we can get some measure of whether the, the birds are doing reasonably well or not. Professor Perrins, you can see, is currently measuring and weighing the birds. These birds, I think, are they can be quite vicious. I mean, they don't make a lot of noise, only an hissing noise when they're angry and they blow their necks out very, you know, large and they look very aggressive, but they're not really. But uh, the reason you have to set them quick is because they've got their wings are so powerful uh, and they can bring it over and catch you. And I've, I've cut my eye in the few years and there are lots of scratches where their 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 feet, like they've got little hooks on their little nails. And if that, if you don't get them quick, I can scratch your mark here. Nine six seven. Nine six seven. Okay. Thank I think it's a highly quintessential English tradition, but as I said, it's actually quite useful to have the have the counts annually, and it's as good a way of doing that as any other. Okay. So. All right. So in closing, um, let's go back to royal hounds uh, and King Charles Spaniels. So on the day of Charles III's coronation, 150 King Charles Spaniels took part in a parade down the King's Road in Chelsea in London. And here are a couple of uh, images that I'll show you. It was a wet, it was kind of a wet day. It wasn't the nicest weather. Um, and I think some of the dogs had more fun than others, but they were kitted out with little kerchiefs. And I love the little blue booties on this one and crowns, uh, and, and so it was, it was quite a spectacle to see all these little dogs traipsing down the road. And I'll close with this quote that you may have seen in the description of the talk. This is um, Queen, uh, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, uh, Queen Elizabeth's daughter, with her dogs, uh, and it says, golf seems to be an arduous way to go for a walk. I prefer to take the dogs out, and that seems an apt way to end this presentation. So. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, am I on? I am on camera. Okay. You can unmute yourselves if you have any comments or questions. Um, feel free to feel free to unmute yourselves. Oh, you're you're. Um, I think you're muted. There was that. Oh, there me? you go. Yep, I you're good. You're good. Oh, yep. Okay. Nope. Um, it's actually not about the animals, but the uh, which were lovely. Thank you. I mean, I just loved it all. But uh, 
I'm so curious about these livery companies. Oh, yeah. I mean, what is who are those people? It's it's so, is it like a country club? No, I mean, they're no, all, no. or they what what are they? Yeah. So they go back to the Middle Ages, and they were yeah. kind of like trade associations, and they were founded in London. They're London based, and the yeah. idea behind them they they were called medieval guilds originally. They were right. guilds originally. So the idea behind them was almost kind of like a how would we describe it now? They, they, they served several roles. So they, they, were, they would bring all together all of the tradespeople from one profession. So printers, brewers, uh, bread makers, what have, bakers, what have you. And it would kind of be like a collective of these people to make sure that they were all trading in a manner that was congenial and not cutting each other off. Then they became a, an organization where you would pay membership dues and you would get kind of, if you became ill, the guild would take care of your family, mm -hmm. would help take care of you. They might carry the, they might cover some of the burial costs. Um, and, and you found in medieval London, if you walk around some of the streets, even in the, what we call the city of London today, that one square mile where London was kind of founded by the Romans and was still the medieval city, you still find these little tiny alleyways and little tiny streets that are named after the different professions that did business in those streets. So they would all kind of cluster together. So all of the, uh, you know, all of the leather workers would be in one street right. one area. So this was just kind of a collective of these people together. And over time, it kind of morphed into, again, you know, you pay dues and they would look after your family members if you became ill or something. Yeah. And people could join, they could join as, um, apprentices so if your father was was in a guild and you were the son you could then join the guild as a, an apprentice and spend seven years learning the trade didn't guarantee you would get a job but you could learn the trade and then they became they morphed into the, they're called livery companies now um because at one point they all started wearing different livery different mm -hmm. clothes to distinguish themselves mm -hmm. and now today they do mostly charitable things mm -hmm. they are more exclusive it is a little more exclusive now it's not quite the same and there are oh gosh I think don't quote me on this but maybe 109 they've, they've expanded so far out they even have I think a um a worshipful company for like electronics and stuff you know I mean like IT workers or so I don't know they've, they've really expanded out so um, it is still connected to, yeah, to yeah, actually yeah. doing the trade. That's what I was getting at. Well, I know about the guilds. Yep, yep. It makes no sense in today's economy. And those guys didn't look like dyers and they could have been yeah. dyers and vintners, yeah. but what does that mean? Yeah, they so, are still connected in some, in in some, some way. way. Yeah, they do still have some kind of connection. Now, yeah. again, some of them are obviously more relevant in today, like you said, right. today's economy than others. But there are still the beautiful old buildings you can walk around and see. They right. each have their own buildings and occasionally in September every year, London has an open house weekend. And occasionally uh -huh. one of some of the buildings will be open and you can go in and they're very ornate. I mean, they're very, uh -huh. and again, so go back, you know, uh -huh. the interiors go back hundreds what, of hundreds How do of they, years. can I read more about them? I'm curious. Yeah. Oh, like how yeah. they connect to the, not only the, well, I know there's some history with the, the formation of the labor movement, Yeah, but like the current labor party, how do they connect to that? Who pays for that expedition with the swans? I mean, that's what I, I mean. It, it they looks, pay for them. Yeah, they, they pay for they, themselves. Yeah. yeah, they pay for them themselves. Yeah. There it's is a, no... it's a, and is it all men? Yeah, it's I think a big so. Men's I club. think so. I shouldn't quite yeah. say that, but I think so. I've never yeah. seen a woman out on one of those skiffs. Right. I could be wrong. I could and be wrong. I'm just so curious yeah. about their class position and everything. That's what I'm curious yeah, about. Like how? Not... I mean, and it's so British. It's so it's so... very. It's very British. Yeah. I don't. There's no connection to any political party. There's no collection to connection to the right. labor party because the labor movement isn't really. Right. It is and isn't part of the labor party. You know, I mean, the labor party yeah. is kind of, it's not really the modern is, the labor yeah. movement as we see it, as we know right. it today. Um, right. But yeah, and I do get the sense they do seem somewhat, and this might be unfair again, and someone could correct me if I, I do think they are somewhat privileged. <laughs> you know, they have fancy so. dinners, they have, you know, they, yeah, yeah. 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 But you did hear the one man talking. Swans. Yeah, well, the one <laughs> man was talking about getting yeah. cut by the swan. He had a very working yeah. class accent. You know, I mean, he yeah, wasn't right. he wasn't posh. He wasn't a posh man, at least from his accent. Yeah. But yeah, it's very interesting. This whole and they own 
they own some of the swans. And basically, again, they just go out and help make sure the swans are healthy. And yeah, you know, yeah. 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 See, but yeah, if I, I can see, I'll send you something. I'll see if I can find or share, okay. it, with, uh, I'll, I'll share right. it with Leslie and she can share it. Yeah, on the livery companies. Okay. Other comments or questions? Okay, well, as I said, we got a little out of order here because this was supposed to be the closing uh, talk in this series and it was just supposed to be a little fun different, but in two weeks I will be doing the one I had to postpone on the Georgians, so that'll be same day, same time, two weeks from today. And then I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to be traveling, um, I'll knock on wood, um, I'll be in London for a while. But I well, will be putting together a new series. I'm not going to launch that one until I've got to talk to the office, but I'm not going to launch that one until the spring of, uh, or January, maybe, I don't know, early, early 2024. And that one's going to actually be on um, queen consorts. So I thought we've been talking a lot about these, these male monarchs. Let's talk about some of the women behind them. That's and, great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've done a couple, you know, I did Anne Boleyn and, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, but they are, um, they were the more famous queen consorts, the, the wives of the kings. And I wanted to highlight some of the maybe ones you haven't heard of or don't know so well and talk about their role uh, in the monarchy and how they, how they impacted the, the monarchy. So um, I'll be putting that together. It's going to take some time to research and write some of those. So that's what I'm going to be doing this fall, along with spending some time in London collecting collecting information and taking photographs and hopefully hopefully if COVID doesn't interfere again having mm -hmm. a lot of fun doing that nice. um, so look for that but again we've got one last one in this series which will be two weeks from today and that that's the Georgians and then that'll close this out so thank you as always for coming and spending this sunny cloudy sunny cloudy afternoon uh, indoors with me and uh, see you in a couple of weeks then Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Dave. Bye, everybody. You're welcome. Bye.